Happy Monday. John Lorden here with another episode of Brain Scratch Case Cracked. If you're here in the US, today is also Labor Day. So if you're taking the day off or if you have to work, whatever's happening, I hope you have an excellent day. Chrissy's been hard at work working on another case for us to review. This is one that I like to call Scared Silent. Chehalis which means shifting sands, is a city of just over 7,000 people located in Lewis County, Washington. The Chehalis River, named for the muddy bottomland along the shore, would frustrate locals in the logging trade for over a century. Even today, logging is a huge part of the local economy, and the family of Ed and Minnie Marin had quite the foothold. Ed and Minnie sold Christmas trees from the tree farm on their property, and Minnie's son, Dennis Hadler, owned Dennis Hadler Logging, one of the largest logging companies in the Northwest during the 1980s. If you worked in the woods of Lewis County, Hadler Logging probably employed you. On December 19, 1985, Ed and Minnie were expecting company. The elderly couple had invited friends and family members over for an early Christmas party, but as people started to arrive, they noticed that something was wrong. The Morin's green Chrysler was not in their driveway. As people started to enter their unlocked home, they found paperwork and bank statements strewn all over the floor. But what worried their family the most was Minnie's purse sitting forgotten in a corner. Minnie would never leave her purse. Quote, I thought somebody grabbed Ed and my mother and that they would hold them ransom, Dennis Hadler stated. Early the next morning, an employee at the Yardbird shopping mall reported a vehicle matching the description of the Morin's car. The car looked as though it had sat in the parking lot all night, but the elderly couple was nowhere to be found. As officers walked up to the car, the cold morning had left a sheen of ice on the windows. Instead of touching it and leaving fingerprints, one of the officers blew warm air onto the glass. Once the ice started to melt, he could see that the car was covered in blood, with damage from shotgun pellets going into the dash. No one at the supermarket saw the car pull in. Over the next few days, family members gathered with search and rescue officers and started efforts to locate the couple. Volunteers and family members were each given an area of the county to search. With almost 200 volunteers, along with officers, the community began to sweep the local landscape. They knew the elderly couple wouldn't make it long out in the open during the winter with life-threatening injuries. For days, everyone searched the endless logging roads and woods that surrounded the county. As investigators started to question people in town, they would learn that the local community had at least saw the couple the day they disappeared. Several witnesses reported seeing not only their car driving through town, but it was also seen at the Sterling Savings and Loan Bank. On Christmas Eve, the family would receive the call none of them wanted. On a lonely dirt road in a wooded area in Stearns Hill, a friend of the family, searching a logging road, found the bodies of Ed and Minnie. Both had been shot in the back with a shotgun. Their bodies lay together after being dragged from their car and dumped in the woods. Quote, The hard part is they were scared to death in their last few moments together. And then one of them had to see the other one die. Their granddaughter, Denise Hadler, would remember tearfully. Newly married... Denise was pregnant with twins at the time of the murders, but the news of her grandparents' death traumatized her so much that she lost both children. The only piece of evidence investigators were able to uncover was a bank receipt in Ed's pocket from Sterling Bank, the same bank witnesses had stated they saw the Morins at on the day they disappeared. When officers called the bank, they were told that Ed had called on the 19th and asked for $8,500 to be taken out of one of their accounts. Upon arriving at the bank, 
Ed's money was still being gathered, but instead of staying in the bank, he went back out to his car. When the teller had the money ready, she walked out, only to be intercepted before she got to the car by Ed, who took the money and left. With a lack of suspects, the town started to accuse each other. Some thought the Morin's grandson, Mike Hadler, could be responsible. Mike liked to drink and frequently got into fights. With his many run-ins with the law, he immediately became a suspect, but after questioning, Mike would be cleared. Other witnesses were questioned along with suspects, but no one would be charged for the murders. As the years went by, investigators never forgot the Morins or gave up their search for their killers. In May of 2004, a new officer at the police force decided to take on the case and was determined to solve it. His name was Bruce Kimsey. He had grown up in Chehalis, and he always remembered the Morin murders. After going through the massive amount of information in the case files, he decided to go back and talk to every witness listed in the documents. Chehalis is a small town, and police always felt that someone in town, possibly someone they had already talked to, had seen the Morins driving that day and saw who was in the car with them. After updating old lineup photos from black and white to color and improving the quality, some witnesses began to pick two men out of the lineup, claiming the quality of the photos before was so poor that only after the upgrade were they able to see the pictures clearly. Witnesses consistently picked out Rick and John Reif. Now Detective Kimsey had a direction to go in but still not enough evidence to make an arrest. A year later, in May of 2005, officers would finally get the information they needed to make an arrest. A local man named Jake Shriver contacted the Morin's grandson, Mike Hadler, with an important tip. The day the Morins were abducted, then 17-year-old Jake was riding in his mother's car along Highway 12 when they passed the Morin's Chrysler on the road. Ed was driving with Minnie in the passenger seat, but there were also two men in the back seat. He knew both of these men from the Christmas tree farm the Morins ran. It was two brothers, Rick and John Reif. A few days after the murders, Jake stated that John Reif came to his house and confronted him. He demanded to know if Jake had told anyone that he had seen the brothers that day. After admitting that he hadn't told anyone, Reif told him that if he ever did, the same thing that happened to the elderly couple would happen to him and his family. Reif said, quote, we'll kill your mother, we'll kill your brothers, we'll kill your dad, then we'll kill you. Daily for an extended period of time, the Reif brothers would drive by the Shriver home. This terrified Jake, who was convinced they could and would make true on their promise if he talked. So for 20 years, he stayed silent until he couldn't take the guilt any longer. With Jake Schreiber's statement, investigators now felt they had enough evidence to arrest the Reif brothers. Because they had moved to Alaska in 1987, it would take time for them to be tracked down. But with an arrest warrant in hand, finally, in 2012, Detective Kimsey brought, bought plane tickets to King Solomon, Alaska, to make an arrest. He would find out that the brothers spent most of their stolen money on cocaine, then moved to Alaska, and only one week before investigators arrived there, John Reif died of natural causes. In 2013, after only a day and a half's deliberation, a jury found Rick Reif guilty for the 1985 kidnapping, robbery, and murders of Ed and Minnie Marin. The jury found the 55-year-old former Alaska man guilty on all counts, including two counts of first-degree murder, two counts of kidnapping, robbery in the first degree, as well as one count of first-degree burglary. They also found him guilty on special allegations of lack of remorse, acting as an accomplice, and of the victims being particularly vulnerable. He was sentenced to 103 years in jail and ordered to pay $26,594 in restitution to the victim's family, which would cover their funeral and trial-related expenses. Reif remained emotionless as the judge read the verdict. At his parents' funeral, Dennis Hadler had made a promise over their caskets. He swore that he would not rest until he found out who killed them. Quote, 
that took a big load off of my shoulders because I made that promise and I was getting worried as I got older that maybe I was going to fail, Hadler said. But I had strong support from the prosecutor's office and the sheriff's office, and we were able to get a conviction. Case cracked. Thank you to Como News, People, Cron Online, Daily Mail, ABC News, TDN, Cold Case Files, and Wikipedia for information found in today's episode. This is one of those stories that, despite the fact that we have justice arrive, still just breaks my heart, especially after seeing the pictures of Ed and Minnie. This looks like just the couple that all of us want to be when we get older, uh, especially in some of these photos. They just they look so joyful and happy. Obviously, they have a family that cares about them deeply. Um, it's a shame that any time was taken away from that family that they could have had with Ed and Minnie. Uh, I know it's one of those things I look into a lot of cases sometimes that involve the, the killing of elderly people. And I don't think it's any less tragic because people are older in age, or maybe they've even lived longer than some other people get so long. It's always tragic. If there's not just one more moment that they could have spent with their family, one other special memory that they could have made and had with their families. Um, it just really breaks my heart that we see this, this in these cases. And honestly, in this case, for $8,500, it's really, really sad to me. Um, I know there was a little time gap in there because they started recognizing people in 2005. They started putting together the information then, but it took until 2012 before the arrest actually took hold. Uh, I don't know why that time gap is there. Just to let you guys know, we didn't find it in the information that we had looked through. I don't know if it was them tracking down the fact that these guys had moved off to Alaska. Um, I think there's probably some other factors that could be at play there, but we don't have a solid answer in terms of the time frame. I'm thankful that we had Jake step forward. Um, that really seemed to be, if there was one critical piece that cracked this case, uh, it seems like it was really Jake. They needed that testimony. They needed that information. Even though they were zeroing in on the guys because of the photo lineup, um, to have someone that says that they were actually threatened by these guys and to be able to use that in the prosecution, I think was probably a, a much stronger position and really helped this happen. So considering a 17 year old was being terrorized by these two guys like this, it might have taken them some time, but Jake really did the right thing there. And I'm really thankful that there's people like him in this world to help justice arrive in some of these cases. I'd like to give a very big thank you to some PayPal supporters, starting with Amanda Beard. Thank you so much, Amanda. Chi Chi Fashion Jewelry and Rita Maria Wanninger. Thank you again, Rita. And uh, I really appreciate having your support with all this. If you would like to support through PayPal or Patreon or by buying merchandise, you can do all of that at www.lordandarts.com. Once again, if you're taking today off, hope you enjoy it. If you're working, maybe I hope you actually enjoy it more. Maybe, maybe you deserve just a little extra joy than the people that are just hanging out all day. But have a wonderful day. I'll see you back here on Wednesday with a brand new Searchlight on the Lord and Arts channel.